You know, there's a story that's floated around for years about a church that had a reputation of being a contentious and, and not very loving church that hires a new pastor. So that pastor comes into town and preaches his first sermon. And the first sermon is theologically accurate, it's biblically sound, and there's a lot of great application. And the congregation loves it. They, they're like, wow, we love our new pastor. So the next Sunday rolls around, and the pastor again preaches a sermon that's, that's biblically sound, theologically accurate, and has a lot of application. But the church is kind of going, well, what's the deal here? Because it was the same sermon from the first Sunday. Well, Sunday three rolls around, and the pastor preaches the exact same sermon. And at this point, the congregation is going, what the heck? And we, now we don't know about this new pastor. And so the elders decide to approach the pastor, and they come to him and say, hey, pastor, you know, you just preached the exact same sermon you did the last two weeks, and we're kind of concerned about that. Don't you have a different sermon? And the pastor replied to the elder, he goes, well, yeah, I do. And when I'm convinced that you've heard the first sermon, then I'll go on to that next sermon. Now, some of us are like that, probably most of us are like that. We need to hear things over and over again. And sometimes it's because we didn't hear it the first time. But most of us need to hear things over and over again because we just need reminders. We forget. We need to hear things again and again. This last year, I needed to keep hearing over and over again, and maybe many of you did too, that God is sovereign, that God is in control, that God's got this. I know waking up 4 a.m., I, need, I needed to remember that. Going to bed, I needed to remember that. In the midst of newscasts, I needed to remember that. Now, here at the fields, we've just finished up a study in the book of Jonah and Nahum, and we're heading into a 12-week study in the book of Job. So you can read ahead. I encourage you to do that in the book of Job. But we're at an interlude here, and I decided that at the interlude, we probably should hear something again. This weekend, believe it or not, we are actually at the one-year anniversary of when the COVID pandemic went worldwide, where, where everybody went, whoa, and, and we locked down. I, I'm finding it hard to believe that I have a senior in high school that has been online for 12 months doing school and has not set foot on campus during that 12. That's, that's wild. A year has gone by. And so I thought it would be good for us to hear a message about what biblical unity is and why it's so important and how we get there. The last 12 months has stretched just about everyone far beyond what we thought we could be stretched. It's been straining our relationships, nations have been strained. Marriages have been strained. Families have been strained. Neighbors have been strained. And we've been strained with strangers too. And yeah, in the midst of that, churches have been strained relationally. Now, I'm incredibly thankful for the fields. This last week, I, I wrote you guys, if you're on our email list, I wrote you an email saying thank you. You guys have been incredible. You guys have stood by with our leadership here at the church, at the fields, as we've worked really hard to navigate these troubled waters and make decisions that would first honor God and then would honor others and would help us to be a light to our community. And we know as leaders, we have not led perfectly. In fact, there is no such thing as perfect leadership. It doesn't exist, but, but we, as, as, as your pastors, as your elders here, we have been on our knees praying to the Lord for wisdom. We have been in the scriptures looking for wisdom. We have endeavored to listen to the Lord, and we have listened to you. And you know what that thank you letter was about, was I have never seen so much positive support in the last 12 months from a church than what we've seen with you guys. You guys have been amazing, and we thank you for your grace and your patience as we've led through this difficult time. But this morning, because of all the strains that our world has felt the last 12 months, I'm going to re-preach a sermon that I gave just a few months ago 
from Philippians chapter 4. And I'm re-preaching it not because you need correction. I mean, some of you probably do. But I'm re-preaching it because we need to hear these words over and over again. Just like every Sunday, we need to hear the gospel over and over again. I need to hear it. I need to hear it daily. I need to be reminded of where I'm anchored and where my hope is. We need important reminders. And here we need the reminder of the importance of the unity within the body of Christ. And this issue of unity within the church of Jesus Christ is so incredibly important that Jesus... Before he headed to the cross, he prayed for his followers in what is sometimes called the high priestly prayer. He prayed for his followers to have unity, to have oneness, and not just for those that were there present, but in this prayer, as you're going to hear, in fact, you can turn to it, John chapter 17. I want to highlight a couple couple of those, those, those words from the prayer. He prays for you. He prays for those that would follow later. So so this prayer is specifically for you. You can read this. Now, all of Scripture is for us, but he's praying for you. Listen to what he says in John chapter chapter 17, verse 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, the ones that were gathered right there as he's praying, but for those also who believe in me through their word. That's us. We believe in what the apostles taught, the words of Jesus. That's us. He's praying for us. And he's praying, verse 21, that they, we, may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Jesus is praying that we may be one, that we may experience perfect unity like the Father and Son. And why is he praying this? He's praying this so that the whole world can see who Jesus is through what Jesus is doing in his church, in his people, in us. It's so incredibly important that Jesus prays for this. Now, unfortunately, this trying time that the world has gone through these last 12 months has not always displayed the church at her best. There have been ugly divisions And there have been people who have not demonstrated the grace and forgiveness that we find in the gospel. We've not demonstrated that with each other. And so all of us, I would say all of us, need to do some repenting. We need to heed the words that Jesus prayed and we need to come clean. Just just like as Christians. Christians are people who are in the habit of daily repenting because we sin all the time. And so we come to God, believe in the gospel, and we repent. We need to repent of not having the unity that Jesus has called us to and and prayed for us. Now, we won't always agree with each other. No two people on the planet completely agree with each other. In fact, husband and wife, who are called in Scripture to be one flesh, we don't always agree with each other, do we? My, My wife in first service was raising her hand when I said this, amen, yeah, We don't have a perfect, there's no such thing. But we learn to apply the gospel in those relationships. And we can give grace and show patience and forgiveness as Christ has forgiven us. And that's the calling for God's people. Now, I'm not going to really re-preach that sermon in full that that I preached four months ago. I've actually rewritten it and inserted some things, taken some things out. But we are going to look at Philippians chapter 4 that we were in about four months ago. So if you have your Bibles, and I'm encouraging you, bring your Bibles. Bring your Bibles. I know electronic devices are awesome. I use those all the time. But hard copies are a little little less distracting. And turn to Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to see what God has for us because the last 12 months has threatened the unity of God's people, his church 
unlike anything we've seen in recent history. I've talked to, to old guys, pastors that are in their 80s, and they say, yeah, you know what? We never have seen anything like this in, in, in the time that we've been pastors. And so we're in a point in history where we need to hear some words over and over again. Now, if you were with us at that time, four months ago, when I preached this passage the first time, I referred to a historical event that was fairly recent history, back from April of 1992, where we saw the horrific events surrounding Rodney King and the, the L.A. riots and, 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 and the social injustice and all the crazy things that happened. Mr. King made a statement shortly after all that happened, and he, and he said this, can't we all just get along? And those words can be applied to any conflict. Conflict between a husband and wife, conflict between siblings, conflict between neighbors, and especially between members of the body of Christ. What a great call. Can't we all just get along? This is what God wants for us, to get along as brothers and sisters in Christ, to treat each other with love and compassion and grace and patience and equality and forgiveness. But we know, left to our own devices and on our own strength without the gospel, no, we can't all just get along. Human history proves it. And unfortunately, church history proves it too. We're critical with each other. We bite and devour. We grumble and complain. And that's just the church alone, let alone the culture itself. And it's so incredibly sad that often we see conflict is what characterizes the followers of Jesus Christ. And instead of the fruit of the Spirit, which is what God has for us. So no, on our own, no, we can't get along. Almost from the beginning we couldn't. When there were just four humans on the planet, Cain kills his brother Abel. Conflict. And conflict has been the history of humanity. And the church of Jesus Christ is not immune to this sin either. Just look at the New Testament. We have the conflict between the Jewish believers and the non-Jewish believers. We have conflict between two important leaders in the church, Peter and Paul. And we even have disagreement, that which, which is not moral disagreement, but between Paul and Barnabas on whether they should take Barnabas' cousin John Mark with them on a future missionary endeavor. The human heart is desperately wicked, and, and that's why we need a Savior. Someone to save us from sin and death, to save us from ourselves, to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. We need his righteousness because we don't have our own righteousness. And that's the gospel. It's only the gospel that can bring reconciliation. Reconciliation between God and man and reconciliation between brother and sister, sister and sister, brother and brother. And that's exactly what we have as Christ's followers. We have the gospel of reconciliation. We have the gospel of peace. Based on what we've experienced, the forgiveness found in the gospel, we now can show that forgiveness to others. We can learn to apply the gospel, to live in the gospel, and yes, we do have what we need to get along if we believe and apply the gospel. So that's where we're going this morning. And we're, again, going to begin by looking at Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 2. There, Paul had just written to the Philippian believers. He's told them, stand firm. Stand firm in what? Stand firm in the gospel. What you've been taught about the gospel. And in the midst of that, he goes a rather interesting direction. Right from that, he goes to address a conflict within the church. It was public. He's not shaming anybody. Everybody knew about it. But it was a conflict between two dear beloved women, Yodi and Syntyche, 
And he addresses it with these words. I urge Yodia, I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Paul pleads with them. He said, guys, we're on the same team. We're partners in the gospel. Let's get along with each other. And man, do we need to hear those words in the church today. Now, we don't really know a lot about these two women. All we really know, basically, is what we have here and then the immediate context of the whole letter where Paul is addressing some issues of unity. Philippi was a healthy church in general, but no church is perfect, and, and so they had some issues to deal with. And what we do know about these ladies is that they were part of the church in Philippi. We know that they were followers of Jesus. We know that these women were partners in the gospel with Paul. They had struggled together for the same cause. They were on the same team. They were pulling together, and yet conflict had happened. Their names were written in the book of life, which is a reference to their eternal salvation. Sisters in Christ, fellow workers, and some kind of big conflict that Paul has to address, and he addresses it publicly. Not to shame them, as we'll see, but that the church can lovingly help them work through this issue they had. Now, it's probably good that we don't know that much about them, and probably good that we don't know what that conflict is, because that, in one way, allows us to not just push those words aside and go, well, I don't have that problem. We all have conflict. And so these words apply to us. They, they, they are there for us to learn to work through. Now, it might have been over something as silly as what color to paint the women's bathroom in the church. Now, they didn't have a building. They didn't have a women's bathroom. But silly things like that have divided churches. It, it's crazy, but it's happened. But we know other things. Maybe it was over something a little bit more important, like do you worship inside or outside or online during COVID? Or it could have been about something crucial. Can Jewish believers now mix with non-Jewish believers? Because the Jews were taught that they couldn't, but now the gospel comes and equals the playing field. We don't know what that conflict was. We do know there was probably not a significant doctrinal error because Paul never shied away with directly dealing with doctrinal error, gently correcting something like that. But whatever it was, it was big enough for Paul to address. It was big enough that the whole church knew about it. And it was big enough for Paul to call on the church to not be mean to these ladies, but help them as sisters in Christ get along for the sake of the gospel. Now, think about this. I said this four months ago, but it's poignant. Can you imagine being one of these two ladies? That for all of eternity, your name is written down in the Word of God as someone who couldn't get along with another one. Now, that's a bummer thing. It's like, oh man, I'd hate to be one of them. But the fact of the matter is, all of us have lived that way, so the words do apply to us, and, and Paul's pleading for them. Paul had already written to them in this letter in Philippians chapter 2 words about how to, how to get along and, and work with each other, probably laying the foundation for this specific address. Look at Philippians 2.1. Paul there had written, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection or compassion, great words, make my joy complete, what? By being of the same mind. Maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Be other centric. Have this attitude. In yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. When you look at that picture, this is for 
all of us in the body of Christ. Because of what Jesus has done to unite us to himself, be of one mind, same mind, of the same love, united in the spirit, intent on one purpose, which was a partnership in the gospel. Be about the gospel, guys. And this doesn't mean that you can't have your own opinions. Sure, we're going to have differences. We're not clones. There's going to be a variety. We're going to interpret the scriptures differently sometimes. But don't be selfish or conceited about it. Instead, walk in humility towards one another. Regard others as more important than yourself. Look out for the needs of others. Basically, look at how Jesus had given himself for others and follow that example. Again, look at Philippians 4.2. I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. These women had worked hard for the gospel. They had struggled and labored with Paul. They're called fellow workers. They're team members. And yet their conflict is tearing them apart. And it's tearing the church apart. And it's hurting the witness of the gospel. That's why this needs to be addressed. Now, you know what's interesting? When you think about unity, there's a great verse in the Psalms that talk about that. In fact, what's, what's, it's no coincidence. Um, I didn't tell our new children's ministry director, Megan, hey, this is what I'm preaching on this month or, or this week. But she randomly, and again, it's not random, God's providential over everything. She had picked a verse for our kids this month for our children's ministry to memorize. And it comes to us from Psalm 133, verse 1. And the verse is this. Behold, how good... And how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. This is what God has for his church. Unity. And the blessings of unity. That's what Jesus prayed for. Unity of his people so that the world would see him. You know, yesterday I hung out with a guy who has a pretty popular um, uh, uh, podcast. And I just stumbled onto him about a month or two ago. He's up in Orange County. So I reached out to him. I was going to be up in Huntington Beach for one of my kids' surf contests. I'm like, hey, would you want to get together? He responded, I go, yeah. We hung out on the beach for three hours, and we talked about Jesus and the gospel. This guy's an evangelist, and, and it's just so neat to hear the stories. I didn't know him from Adam yesterday morning. And after three hours, I felt our hearts were knit. We actually shed some tears about hearing about people come to know Jesus and love Jesus. And like, this is a brother in Christ. The unity we share because of the gospel is a beautiful thing. And yet we don't always experience that. The psalmist says, it's wonderful. This is what God has. This is what Jesus is praying for us. But we don't always conduct ourselves in unity. And when we don't, the world fails to see Jesus. Paul warns Timothy about the conduct we should have as partners in the gospel. Listen to 2 Timothy 2.24. He writes this, the, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Look at those traits. Look at those traits for ministers of the gospel. And, and here's the deal. If you are a follower of Jesus, it doesn't matter if you're part of the, the fields or another church. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've embraced the gospel that's clearly revealed in Scripture. God's called you a minister of the gospel. It's not the paid or the unpaid, the laid pastors that are the... You guys, you guys are ministers of the gospel. And this is how Paul has called us on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to conduct ourselves. We're not called to be quarrelsome. We're called to be kind to all. Yes, all. You know, this, this last year, this last fall as a church, 
united together, we read a book about kindness called Love Kindness. And it challenged us to show kindness to everyone, not just those you live with, those you are in church with, but also those that don't need just need know Jesus, that our, our kindness may help lead them to repentance as God, God's kindness has led us. So good. We're called to be patient when wrong. We're called to correct, but to be gentle in our correcting. We are not wishy-washy about what we believe, but we correct with gentleness, with the goal in mind, helping people come to their senses so they will escape the snares of the evil one. It's a rescue operation. You know, a gentle way to correct someone is to ask good questions and not be accusative. You know, I, I'm still having to learn this as a parent. I wish I'd learned this early on. You know, when, when, when you're correcting a child, ask good questions. I, I too often am ready, fire, aim. Okay, think about it. Ready, fire, aim. That's not a good way to do things, okay? You know, instead, seek to understand. Don't judge first. Ask good questions. Dig on the heart as God deals with our hearts. Be slow to judge. Think about Christian leaders you know in the news or even those here at the fields. Do you see these character traits that Scripture talks about? Do you see them in yourself? Are you quarrelsome? Are you always a negative person? What causes these quarrels? Well, James talks about it. James chapter 4, verse 1. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source... Your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. See, God cares about the heart. Wrong motives so you may spend it on your pleasures. We need to do the heart check. When we're struggling in conflict, we need to ask ourselves, what is going on in my heart? Do I want to win? Is it I want to be right? Do I feel that there's been injustice against me? And that's exactly what the gospel does. It delves deep into our hearts and it exposes what's going on in our hearts. See, the gospel is a gospel of peace. Jesus sheds his blood so that we might have peace. Because of him, unity exists among us, and we have access as one people to God because of the work of Christ. And because of this peace, we are to work at peace as far as possible, peace with all people. Listen to the words of Scripture again. Romans 12, 16. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly, do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will, re -reap, you will heap sorry, a burning coals on his head. Here's the deal. Be at peace with all people. Aim for that, if at all possible. Now, there are times when it's just not possible to agree. It happened with Paul. And Barnabas, if you don't know the story, read Acts chapter 15. You read about it. Paul and Barnabas, with a team of people, had just gone up, planted a bunch of churches. They go down to Jerusalem. They tell the Jerusalem church, look what happened. All these Jews and all these non-Jewish people come to faith. They are excited. And now they're getting ready to go back to those churches to strengthen them and plant more churches. And as they're getting ready to go and they're packing their bags, Paul and Barnabas are, are, are talking. And Barnabas goes, hey, and let's take my cousin John Mark with us. And Paul goes, what, what are you thinking? Don't you remember that, that John Mark bailed on us the last trip? We're not taking him with us. And Acts chapter 15, 39 says this, or 19 says this. 
And there occurred such a sharp disagreement with Paul and Barnabas that they separated from one another. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. Here's an example in Scripture. It wasn't a moral, that we understand, disagreement. It wasn't a theological disagreement. It just was a disagreement. And there's an important principle here that, that um, an older man in, in the Lord kind of shared with me a while back. Here's the principle. Sometimes in life, you can't take John Mark with you and leave John Mark at the same time. There had to be a decision. Paul says, I don't want to take him. Barnabas says, well, I do. It wasn't moral. And so they parted company. And even God used that. Sometimes you can't have it both ways. So sometimes in the body of Christ, it's okay to agree to disagree. We've talked about that. Think about Whitfield and the Wesleys. But we're warned in Galatians to be careful. Galatians 5.13, we read this. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but instead, through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And here's the warning. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not concerned, consumed, sorry, consumed by one another. We can agree to disagree, but the modus operandum of the church is love. That's what we're called to first and foremost. And sometimes that love is a tough love, but we're called to that. Listen to Romans 14. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. What was going on in the church there is some Christians, they were having a conscience issue. Now, it was common in those pagan days that, that the pagans would go, they'd do an animal sacrifice at a temple, and then that, that food, that meat, was sold in the marketplace. And some Christians were going, you can't eat that. That was offered to a pagan, pagan deity, a, a false god. And other Christians are going, yeah, but that's not really a god, so it's okay to eat it. You know, it's, So they're having a moral conscience issue of that. And, and, and the scriptures go on to address that. Paul says, I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But to the one who thinks it's unclean, it's unclean to that person. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. If you do something that causes another person to stumble, then you're not loving them well. Do not destroy with your food, with your freedom, the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. And folks, I'm going to insert, I'm not adding to Scripture. It's also not about wearing masks and not wearing masks. It's also not about getting a vaccination and not getting. You know, it, 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 it's about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. And that's why, for me, I'll wear a mask anytime they ask me to wear a mask because I, I want peace. I want, I want to serve others. It's not about me. It's about others. Folks, here at the fields, we care about theology. But sometimes you can't take Mark and leave him too. And in that, how do we act with charity towards one another? Are we kind to each other? Do we walk in humility? Do we work to be at peace with each other? Or are we critical of each other, gossiping about one another? Do we believe the best about each other or the worst? We need to be also very careful about theological feudalism or tribalism. Be discerning, yes. Theology matters, but be kind. You know, we live in a culture 
of offense. Everyone is offended. They're offended by little things. They're offended by big things. What if Christians were different than the culture? What if we showed kindness and grace and patience towards one another? What if we didn't seek to crucify everyone or cancel everyone or sue everyone like the culture does? This is what the culture is. And God has called us to something better, more beautiful, that's informed and shaped by the gospel. I've used that quote with you before by Christian writer Philip Yancey. He said, I left the church because I found so little grace. I returned to the church because I found it nowhere else. Folks, the grace of the gospel is not found in the world. And as messed up as we are, we have something the world doesn't have. And that allows us to continue to confess and repent and in humility walk with each other. When we're wronged, as Paul says there in Romans, we don't take revenge. We let God take care of it. Love your enemies instead. That is countercultural. Words we need to hear. You know, it saddens the heart of God when he sees his children not getting along with one another. But as a parent, how many times have I quoted Mr. King? Can't you all just get along with each other? Amen? We don't have any parents here. There we go. Okay, yes. And if you're yet to be a parent, if you become a parent, you'll use that phrase. How is that possible? It's through the gospel. And what is stake is at the gospel. It's our partnership in the gospel and our witness that is at stake. Jesus said, the world will know you're my disciples if you love one another. That's John 13, 35. Now, there are times, as I said, that we're going to disagree, and there are times for division over the right things. We read in this letter, Philippians earlier, that there were some people that were preaching the gospel. It was the gospel, but they're preaching it for the wrong reason. And you know what Paul tells them? Praise God. They're preaching the gospel. the right. Let them do it, even if they're preaching it for the wrong reason. But if you go over to Galatians, there... Paul addresses a different issue. There are some people that are preaching a false gospel, and Paul divides over that. He condemns those people over that. Listen to what Paul says. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we preach to you, then that person is to be accursed, or literally to be damned. There are times to separate. But that's typically over the most important things, like whether or not the true gospel is being preached. You know, as a church, we are in strategic partnership with several organizations out there that are cross-denominational, meaning they have Baptists in them, they have Presbyterians in them, they have Reformed guys in them, and, 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 and they have Anglicans in them. And they're worldwide, it's a couple of these. There's one called the Gospel Coalition. We're part of that. And there's another called Acts 29. We're a part of that. And in those organizations, there are like-minded people that see things slightly different theologically. Now, the Gospel Coalition, it's a coalition about the gospel. We all see the gospel as central and essential, and we believe what was revealed in Scripture about what the gospel is. Same thing with Acts 29. But there's differences within those organizations. For example, okay, we here at the church, we believe the scriptures teach that baptism is for believers. And so that's what we've always practiced here at the fields. That's what our, is on our website. Uh, that's what we do. And in that coalition or, or strategic partnerships we have, we have people, and, and that's what is called credo baptist. We have other people that believe in infant baptism, and that's called pedo baptist. And those people are our brothers and sisters in Christ. In fact, Dr. Julius Kim and, and Dr. Peter Jones, they're Presbyterians. They've come in and preached at the fields. Now, they haven't preached against our view of baptism, and likewise, they've respected that, but we're in partnership with them. And so we can move together because of the gospel. And in those coalitions that we have, we also have a very high view of the Scriptures, that they are the infallible, inerrant Word of God. We all have embraced that. Presbyterians, Baptists, Independents, Lutherans, Anglicans that are in that organization. We're all there. But 
those things that are what we understand is non-essential, we want to give liberty and room to move. There's a quote that some of you may have heard, and it's been debated for years who originated this quote. And historically, we don't know for sure. Some actually recently have said they think a heretic made this quote, but it doesn't matter if it's a heretic or not. If it's true to Scripture, it's, it's God's truth. And the quote goes something like this. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. There are some things worth dividing over. Like if someone is preaching a false god, gospel, a false god, the gospel is essential, that's worth dividing over, but there's non-essentials that we want to give people room and, and, and the ability to move in grace and charity towards one another, not divide over. And even with those that don't embrace things that, that we would embrace, we love you. We're glad you're here. You know, now the fields, we have a confession that we hold to a statement of belief. And we have our vision and our values, which are very clear. We know who we are. We know where we're going. There's no identity crisis. Nothing has changed in that. But we will continue to partner with other churches that are slightly different in other things if they embrace the gospel, if they sit under the authority of the word of God. And this is the unity we believe that God is calling us to. We have some distinctives here at the fields. We believe in the sanctity of life. We believe in God's view of marriage and gender. So we hold to those, but if you aren't there, we still love you. You're welcome to be here. And you know what's great? If, if, if you are not a follower of Jesus, you too are welcomed here. You're loved here. Every week we have people, I know them by name, that come that aren't followers of Jesus yet. We're so thankful that you're here. You're our esteemed guest. We love having you here. We hope one day you'll experience the freedom that is found in Christ. But you're welcome here. But wherever you're at, we want to treat you with charity. There are times to separate, but even then we do it with grace. Paul writes this in that same letter, Philippians. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. If we as a church bite and devour each other and we complain, we're bitter towards one another, we're critical towards one another, the world is going to see that the gospel doesn't work. Instead, Paul appeals for this attitude of humility, of, of not being grumbling, not disputing. And as we, we do that, we, as a church, appear as lights, as lights to a world that so needs to see the gospel, the gospel at work in our lives. Do we really believe and embrace what we say we do? And when we blow it, do we confess and apply the gospel? So critical. Our calling is a calling to be bound together with the perfect bond of love. And I want to wrap up our time by going to a passage that talks about that. It's a passage I use in a lot of weddings I do because it applies really well in marriage, although this is written not just to married people. It's written to the church of Jesus. But, but listen to these words again, and may the word of the, the Lord wash over your hearts. Colossians 3.12. So, as those who have been chosen of God, God's people, God chose you, holy and beloved, God loves you, put on a heart of compassion kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. So also should you forgive each other. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, 
to which indeed you were called into one body and be thankful. Love, the love of Christ is the perfect bond of unity. You know, brothers and sisters, we have been forgiven by God for our treacherous activity, for our sin. We have a debt we never could pay, and God pays that debt for us out of his mercy and grace. How can we not show that same grace and forgiveness to others? We have been blessed so that we can bless others. We've been forgiven so we can forgive others. And as we live in unity, giving each other room to move, God gets glory. The world sees the gospel. Folks, you have been doing well. Those of you that I know, you blow it, we, don't, we all blow it, but you've been doing well. I'm thankful. That's why the letter went out this week. I'm thankful for you. But all of us need that ongoing pattern that Christians live in, a pattern of repenting daily. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask that God through his Holy Spirit would move in your hearts. If, if you have a conflict with a brother or sister in Christ in this church, and I don't know of any that I, that I need to address, but there might be, or, or even with your spouse, or somebody in another church, or somebody across the country, or somebody around the world. If you have that, I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit would lead your heart to repent to God first, and then go to that brother and sister in humility and repent to them and forgive. If they've offended you, you forgive them. If you've offended them, you ask for their forgiveness. And then I'm also going to pray every week. Again, we are blessed with people that don't know Jesus or haven't really been born again. And, and it could be somebody online right now. I'm going to pray. That as, as we pray, you're going to feel something in your heart. You're going to feel a tugging, maybe a pressure. You think, oh, it's, it's indigestion. No, I, the Holy Spirit, and he's pulling on you to repent of your sin, to be born again, to, to believe the gospel you've been hearing or heard this morning, and just say, God, I'm done. I, I need your forgiveness. I, I want what I've heard from the scriptures this morning. I'm going to pray that you will yield to the movement of the Holy Spirit and become born again, experience the forgiveness found in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would continue to move in our hearts. I, I need to hear things over and over again. I need to hear, I'm a sinner, and I'm saved by grace through you, and I repent of my sin, and I'm thankful that you've forgiven me of my sin, and God, would you work in my heart to forgive others well, to live as far as it is possible in peace with others, to be gentle, compassionate, caring, not quarrelsome, also that you give me the strength to live, to walk soundly in sound doctrine, to hold firmly to what has been given to us once and for all, the gospel. Lord, right now as I pray, there may be someone who is feeling that tug on the Holy Spirit, on their heart by the Holy Spirit, that they've never repented of it, and they've never embraced the gospel, really. I pray today that they would go, wow, I, I, I get it, or I want to get it, and Lord, that, that your Holy Spirit, because we know we can't save ourselves, that you would breathe life into them, Jesus, right now, even as we're praying. Would you do this for your glory and your name's sake? We thank you and we worship you for your goodness and your name. Amen.